<laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Um, this, I'm going to introduce the, this is Matt Ellis Safin, and that's my son Nick Reiner, and they are the screenwriters. They wrote the film. And so we're here to uh, talk to you guys, and thank you for coming so much for the, to see this film, the very personal film, the most personal film that I've ever been involved in, and working with Nick and Matt, and drawing from our own experiences and what we went through, and hopefully we can share that with other people, because we, what we've discovered is that a, a, there's hardly a family that doesn't have somebody that's struggling with some type of substance abuse or a friend or somebody that uh, they work with. So hopefully people can connect with it in a in a way that'll be helpful. Just he's hearing this is uh, this was not exactly a, you know a, 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 you know autobiographical, but it does draw from our experiences. This is closer to what we experience. But anybody who has any questions, we're you know I'll answer or the guys, however you want to do. Okay, that's it. Well, yeah, here, here we go. Yeah. Did you ever start out with uh, the the movie being about uh, perhaps autobiographical in the sense that the father figure was a, a successful movie producer director? Did it ever switch? How did it get to be a politician to be the father character? Well, first of all, it wasn't initially. There wasn't even a father and mother in it. Initially, the the these two guys met in rehab, and uh, they started writing notes and characters that they came across, and uh, they, they I had no idea they were even working on it. And they initially it was an it was a half hour, a half hour comedy that they wrote for television, and uh, it was all set in the rehab. No, no, the parents weren't involved. And uh, they showed it to me, and I thought it was funny, but I didn't think it, it really captured the emotion and the depth of what they had gone through. So they went back and they rewrote it and made it into an hour comedy drama. We tried to set it up at some you know, TV places, we couldn't do it. And then it was at that point that I suggested maybe we could make a film out of it, and that's when we introduced the idea of the parents because we wanted to show it from both angles. And I think that uh, the reason we made it a guy who was an actor and a politician is because it close, you know, sort of closely mirrors what I, you know, have been through, and that's I think why we did that. So, what else, anybody? Yeah. I thought the movie was edited really well, and I'm wondering if you could tell me a little bit about uh, the editing process with your editor Bob Joyce. Do you know Bob Joyce? Yeah. He Well, I'll tell you something. Bob is one of the, I mean, I, I, virtually all the films I've ever done up until the last two were with a, Bob, a fellow named Bob Layton, and he couldn't be available for this, and the one I just did about LBJ, and Bob Joyce uh, edited him, and it's, he's as good an editor as I've ever worked with. I mean, he's really talented. And he, find, you know, he does something that I've never done, and now that he does it, I will do it from now on. He, he will take uh, pieces of music, he'll cut scenes to music to give it a rhythm. I usually cut a scene and then add the music in after. I mean, this is temporary music, obviously, when you're in the first stage. And he'll cut a scene to music, and it gives it another life, and it may, gives you ideas for choices that you may not make, except for the fact that the music fills in something and gives it a little emotional thing. He's great, and he also, like I say, worked on this other picture that I just finished called LBJ with Woody Harrelson that's coming out, and he's as good as anybody I've ever worked with. So I'm glad you were talking about Bob Joyce, who I just saw out in the valley. We did a thing out in the valley, for, with, and he lives out there. Yeah, anybody? Yeah, over here. Um, were you guys in rehab more than once? That, the boys can talk about that. Go ahead. She oh. asked if you had been to rehab more than once. Uh, I was only there was the one time. I've been more than once. <laughs> it's hard to kick, huh? Um, sometimes it can be. How many times have you been? Uh, How many times have you been in and out of rehab? I'll be honest, it's been like 17 or 18 times. Really? How old are you now? Me? I'm 22. 
Who's uh, who's talking? Where are they? Oh, right, right back uh, there. Okay, okay, um, right. I started when I was like almost about to turn 15. He was there for like 19. Yeah, from like 15 to 19. And yeah, it's like been three or four years. This doesn't even work, I don't think. Yeah, it's working. It's working. Well, during those years of like 14 to 15, my parents were on top of me. And I think it's hard for a parent not to when you, your kid goes through that because, and I don't know what it's like firsthand, but I wasn't understanding of them that they were really worried for me. And I was just like, why are they disciplining me so much? And they were just like helicoptering over me the whole time. And then later on when I was an adult, like which is 19 is not really an adult, but it's legally an adult, I could then make my own decisions and they stopped you know, not stop caring, but they stopped putting, you know, so much hands-on attention towards me. And that sort of made me feel like, okay, no one's watching me, no one's helping me, I should probably figure this out for myself. And he can tell you about this, like just like with the writing, that was our replacement of, you know, drugs. Because it's not just drugs, it's the whole lifestyle that you get immersed in. Yeah, and I think a good, a big turning point for us was the creativity and like you see in the movie, Charlie finding his voice and finding his outlet and stand up and just being able to get up on stage and being okay with yourself. Like stand up for Charlie was kind of like writing for us and it's just, you know, more boring on screen to see people writing, obviously. So it's like the most lame. Unless thing. you're making misery. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's kind of interesting. It be. It could be. Well, I hope so. I mean, what we're hoping is, yeah, I mean, we're hoping that people, it'll, it'll spark dialogue because, you know, I don't know anybody, like I said, who, who doesn't have a friend or, or a, a loved one that's going through it. And you're seeing it now on the campaign trail. It's a big uh, campaign issue because it's become kind of an epidemic and it's kind of made its way into the suburban middle class neighborhoods. And it's, it's uh, something we need to talk about. They're dying over there. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Just a couple things going on here. I work in special ed at Santa Monica High School. So right. I go around this all the time with the have and the have nots, privilege, not privilege. The difference in rehab for privilege and not so privilege as far as resources, what has been your experience with that? Because I'm in conversations, there are no filters in a high school. You know, and I'm also an actor and I work at a high school and I, so I see this all the time. Well, first of all, there's no difference in terms of how this affects whether you're privileged or not privileged. I mean, it cuts... The treatment. Oh, the treatment. Yeah, yeah. because oh, yeah. the issues obviously cut through, cut through uh, socioeconomic lines. But in terms of treatment, uh, you know, unfortunately, or fortunately in some weird way, the, the expense of treatments that... And they're all over the country. I mean, it's, it's a cottage industry. It's proliferated everywhere. It's kind of a cookie cutter approach, unfortunately. They, 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 everybody, they plug everybody into the same uh, kind of thing where they call it a disease, you know? Now, to me, it's not a disease. The disease is the thing that you're experiencing, the difficulty, the pain, the emotional problems that you have, that you're taking something to get rid, to uh, self-medicate. The disease is not the drug taking or the alcohol taking, it's that's the, that's the medicine, in a sense, to try to help you with the underlying issues, which is the disease. The, and, and that disease, by the way, is different for everybody. So it's not just a one size fits all. People have different issues. So because of that, and because it's now getting national attention, we're starting to understand that people need to be treated as individuals. And first of all, they don't need to be punished. You, you, you don't punish somebody who feel who's who's unhappy or is struggling with themselves or, and is in a lot of pain. You try to help them, and each person needs to be handled individually. And that may not need a big, expensive, uh, you know, rehab center. It may be just that we need to train and educate great therapists to be able to work with. Um, you know, people who are struggling to help them understand why it is they're self-medicating. Why are they, yeah, what's at the core? Why are they doing what they're doing? That's not to say that there aren't elements of AA that are good, which is the community part of it, to know that there are other people struggling like you are. But ultimately, when it comes down to actually helping that individual, that individual's problem is going to be different 
from the, this other guy's problems, you know, and even though they might be taking the same drug for whatever reasons. So I think ultimately there's hope, but it, it, it's, it's, it's a process that's going to take place. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. It's all about coping skills. Right. These kids, these young people, don't know how to cope with their emotions. That's exactly right. That's what leads them to self-medicate. That's exactly right. Down that path. Right. They don't know how to deal with what they're feeling and how to express those feelings. That's how they resort to drugs and alcohol. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. Were you going to say something, Nick? Yeah, just, you know, millions of people, whether they want to admit it or not, struggle with addictions of some kind, of like drugs or whatever. And like, since the 1930s, the most cutting edge, uh, you know, science in this is, you know, AA. And for some people it works. For other people, it doesn't work. And it's a process in which you, you know, they say relapse is a part of recovery. Or if you relapse enough times, you start to think, okay, you know, you're always supposed to believe I'm the problem instead of thinking that the, you know, the bis the uh, treatment, the uh, meanings of the problem, and they're not working for you. And people that can't afford to go to places like this, you know, can, and if they're not, they're considered criminals. And, you know, it's also like people don't feel like they want to talk about this stuff because it has such a stigma attached to it. Yeah, and I think that's always been my problem is the second A in AA. I think AA does work for some people, doesn't work for everybody, but the second A is my problem, which is the anonymous part. Because if we're going to really attack the underlying issues, we have to destigmatize it and say, you know, everybody has, I mean, if you just go through, you know, teenage years, even if you don't take drugs, you're struggling with your identity and confusion and all that. These are things we need to talk about. We need to yeah, the trend, and, and I think that helps because then everybody can say, you know, I'm not so different from this guy or that guy, whatever everybody, you know, whether it's drugs, alcohol, sex, uh, gambling, whatever, overeating, whatever the things are that we're using to make ourselves feel better. That, that, yeah. And it's not, oh, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. It, it, it's not like, I have no idea what I'm going to say. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Well, it was, it, it, we didn't set out for it to be cathartic or it, for it to be therapeutic, but it turned out to be that. I mean, it, it forced me to understand a lot more of what Nick had been going through. I've been to all those meetings. I've been to all the family sessions, but you're told certain things by the counselors that you shouldn't, you shouldn't listen to what your kid is saying because they're lying or whatever. The thing. And what I learned is also is that I know my son better than account than than the experts do, and I listen to everybody just like it says in the film with anybody who had a desk and a diploma because you're you're desperate, you know. You're you as a parent, your first job is to keep your child safe, and if you feel like something is happening, you you'll you'll get desperate. You'll do anything, and what I learned is that I need to listen to him more. I need to pay attention to more what he's go saying and telling me, and I did learn that as as we went through this. Was there any strong disagreements on how the story would be told between the two of you? Yes, there were disagreements. You know, I mean, from Nick's point of view, he understood what he was going through, and he understood the life in rehab, and I understood more of what his mother and I were going through. So we, you know, we pooled our resources, and there were a lot of discussions back and forth, uh, arguments, and times it was really rough. but. And I've said this before, it was the most difficult, emotional, and the most satisfying creative experience I've ever been involved in. Sometimes it would get overwhelming for me, and having Matt, who's like, looks at it from an objective point of view, it's just like, okay, stay on task, you know, we just gotta do it. Sometimes it didn't feel like a movie to me, it felt like it was turning into more of something. And he would just say, like, you know, I don't know. I don't know where you were going. I, I mean, it's a new thing I'm trying out. And I'm never doing. No, what he, no. What he was saying is that that sometimes it was so close to the bone that that would become the thing that you were uh, con uh, confused about. And Matt, you know, because you know, Matt was not Charlie. I mean, Matt was, you know, he would 
push Nick back to, hey, it's not you. This is a, 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 a fiction, and we're going to tell a story. So don't go off the rails thinking that we're now into this psychodrama and psychotherapy. And it was tough for me, too, to keep uh, you know, being able to draw the line between what was reality and what was the, the film. And it was life imitating, art imitating, life imitating, but just spinning around. And it was really hard at times. Yeah, and I think that we decided, like at first, we identified really strongly with, with the characters, and then we realized that we had to distance ourselves from them. And whatever worked in our lives, like we used, but whatever didn't work to make the story most compelling, we, we, we stepped out of it. And so I think that it was important to plumb the depths of like what we've been through, but while keeping a certain distance, and that way, you know, not taking it personally with, with this character trait or that character trait, um, just to make it to make it more of a universal story to, to sort of... But sometimes the scenes, like the scene in the garage when they get into that big fight and he slams the door and all that, you know, we live through versions of that. And so when working on that scene was really hard. I mean, it dredged up all of a sudden. Now, we have some distance from it, and we have way more distance now than we had when we were making the film even. But during that time, I mean, it dredged up. I think that's what made, made it good, you know. Yeah. Um, Rob, I've been a fan of yours since uh, that opening shot in This Is Spinal Tap, where you cross your arms and put your hands in your waist. <laughs> Material that you wouldn't find, usually think you'd find humor in, and then finding humor in it. And I found myself laughing at moments, and I thought, this is such a serious subject matter, but I'm still laughing. <laughs> well, it, it, that's it, good. Like, that's good because, you know, what my feeling is if you're going to make a movie about that reflects life in any way, it's going to be funny and it's going to be sad, and you have to find a way to blend those things. I mean, even a picture <laughs> like Misery has laughs in it. Everything, there's life has laughs in it. And the scene that was one of my favorite scenes in the whole movie is when they're working, you know, they're cleaning the, the bathroom and they get into this discussion of getting the heroin and, and getting and having, the, you know, getting somebody to go down it. And this is an actual discussion that Nick had with somebody at one of those places. And it was like, it's like a, you know, a who's on first for drugs and heroin. And, and heroin. I mean, to me, it's very funny, but it's real. It's actually the discussion they had. You didn't even understand it when I tried to explain it to you. So what, so Nick was thinking, he was like, we need an anecdote. Throw in an anecdote. I'm trying to think of this anecdote. And then he was like, and then this guy told me about this blow job that he received for heroin. And, I, and then I was like, wait, what? <laughs> and he was like, and he went through the, and I was like, wait, who, he sucked his dick for heroin? Yeah. He's like, yeah, I, but, but, but who got the heroin? And, and then I was like, and then, and then we were outside on a smoke break, and, and I like put my cigarette, and I was like, we gotta go upstairs, and just like, basically transcribe the whole misunderstanding that we had just had, and, you know, and it was, and that was the only scene in our first draft that didn't get touched. It, it never got touched. We never, we never changed one word of that there was scene. Red lines through everything, but there was, there was the only bit of white was that scene. That's what makes it so great because it's random. Yeah. You're writing so perfectly, it's not random. So you're yeah. depicting life. Right. So therefore, our lives are very random, and it doesn't make sense. So thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Back here. Yeah. Mid whatever. I did drugs for like 16 years. Quit like 10 days ago. But <laughs> 10 the, days ago. Something like that. I just decided I was done. I quit 10 hours ago. <laughs> <laughs> but the whole point is, like when I was 16, my parents were high end executives, never home, traveled three, four weeks out of the month. And every time they were home, they're like, hey, here's a few grand, go have fun. And what are you going to go do? Yeah. Well, also, if you're feeling empty and that your parents aren't around and you're feeling and you want to fill the hole. I mean, you're, you're, you're filling something up to make yourself feel better. Exactly. And then at the same time, my older brother, this was during 9-11, went off to war. So it's like it was me home alone with my younger brother, who's 10 years younger than me, with a bunch of money inviting friends over to a mansion. And we all had money. Yeah. So it's like we ended up just throwing massive parties in the backyards, inviting thousands of people. Yeah. It ended up actually being that 
we had parties that was 1.10 thousand people. Jesus. And the cops actually showed up and surrounded the whole area and emptied everything and made people stay there until the next morning. Wow. Wow. And that's how widespread it is in high schools. I was part of a giant community of junkies, if you want to put it like that, where we actually knew that more than 50% of the people in high school were doing drugs and other had, had tried them or were interested in right, them. Right, right. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, the thing, how much time has changed because when I was a kid in high school, this is a zillion years ago, we knew one kid that smoked weed. Literally. And then, in the 60s, all of a sudden, drugs became very prevalent, mostly hallucinogens, and then cocaine got added, and you know all these other things got added, to now, we're at a point now where, in high school, it's, it's there. It's there for everybody. Right. Yeah. I think, kind of, honestly, the hippie generation brought it in, and we saw our parents, or whatever, take the lead on it, and it kind of became hyped up, because everybody kept talking about the good old days, and it got more and more hyped up, and all of a sudden people took this stance where we don't know what to do with it, so we're going to shove you away to a camp somewhere where we can kind of hide you away and cover up the problems, because nobody in America or the world wants to admit that we have issues. Yeah, yeah, but, but the good thing now is that all the, all the candidates on the campaign trail are talking about it. And, and Republicans and Democrats are in agreement. It's the one issue that the Republicans and Democrats can agree upon, which is that we have to approach this problem by not being punitive, not, being, not punishing kids who are struggling and don't know and don't have a direction. We, got, we can't punish them, we have to help them. Well, that's a, that's a big problem, too, that you've got, you know, opioids that are being overprescribed, and then when you can't get those, if they cut back, then the cheap heroin uh, flows in. And, uh, and how easy it is to justify taking the pill because you're like, it's not some gooey stuff off the street. It's coming out of a bottle. It's an exact amount. This is cool. I'm popping a pill. I have ADHD, so I'm legally prescribed a low dose of meth, which is Adderall. Right, right. That's right. And if I were to be off of it, um, then I would gradually not be on my insurance, and I would move to the street if I weren't prescribed it. Right. So my doctor's here giving it to me monthly. Right. Monthly. And that's a good doctor. Money, you know? And and the thing is, the thing is, you can you can you can abuse those things. That's what I'm saying. That, and, I, and I'm on my path of trying not to abuse them. And what's funny is, it's just I randomly came to this movie today, and I didn't even know this was happening. So it's just like kind of like happened for me, um, but I'm in the middle of struggling with my doctor prescribing things, the things that I'm addicted to. Oh, wow, wow, so. wow. I definitely dealt with that. And you have to, you have to, uh, work with a, you know, a, a psychopharmacologist, I guess, that you're working with, working with yeah. to, 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 to understand that so that they're not doing that. And so you won't be tempted to abuse. I mean, yeah. you know, for instance, that, uh, no. Right, right. You know, like Vyvanse supposedly is not as addictive as Adderall, or it can't be abused as much as Adderall. I mean, there, are all those things. I mean, it's really tough. Yeah, and it's I'm really conscious of it and aware that you know what I'm saying. So it's just it's, yeah, yeah, it's unbelievable. Like yeah. What? Of course. Sure, sure, there are. Yeah, I mean, there's 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 therapy. There's uh, you know a good psychopharmacologist that you can work with with a therapist. Uh, there's a lot of different types of things. I mean, and there are actual drugs that help people get off heroin, Suboxone, and things like that. You know, but you know Nick points this out, which is if you're taking Suboxone, which is a, an, a, a, an opioid inhibitor that keeps you from one, you know, it, it, it doesn't do anything. You don't want it. The, you can't go to AA because you're thought of as not being clean because you're taking this to get off of that. So that to me is not a, a very good thing, but yeah. I have uh, two quick questions. Nick, was there an Eva in your life? Yeah. Definitely no. not. I want to know how many of those windows did you have to destroy, those stained glass windows? <laughs> Only one. No, that, the funny thing about the stained, oh, in real life. We destroyed a lot. No, but in, in the making of the movie, 
we destroyed a ton of them because to get it to do what it was supposed to do, it, you know, to crack all together, it, we had to hit a lot of windows. I threw a rock and it hit the DP in like the knee and then like, like <laughs> tripped through his pants. Yeah. Because when, I didn't know this, but when you throw a rock through a regular window, it just makes a hole. Yeah, it doesn't There's shatter. There's no cinematic it doesn't explosion, explosion. orgasm of yeah. glass that doesn't happen. Yeah. And was there an evil? No, no, no. We, we invented, the reason we, we invented that part of it is was because we wanted him to have a substitute for what his addiction was. I mean, he was using drugs, using drugs, and just like Common points out, it's, they're a difference. He's leaving to be with a girl, and the girl is replacing uh, the drugs. And then when the girl turns on him and realize, and he's not enough for her, she's going to drink or whatever, and she's going to go, that makes him crash and relapse. So that was the device that we used for that. And, and they do say, don't get involved with people right when you're going, trying to get off. You get somebody who's as unstable as you are, and you feed on each other. Yeah. And congratulations on how far you've come. I'm, I'm curious, a family, if there's two uh, uh, portrayals of the family in, in the film. One is the parents, but the other portrayal is, this, is the group session where there are the two crying Kathy. <laughs> do I know you? Yes, you do. Uh, and so I'm curious what you were trying to convey with that particular scene. Well, it's something that that happened to us. In many of the sessions we had, there were two women both named Kathy, and they cried. And she's and sitting right there. Is one of the Kathys there? There's one of the crying Kathys. And we always thought it was funny because it is no, it's emotional. It's very emotional, and 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 you're hearing somebody else's story. They're telling a story, and it triggers your feelings. And so there you go, and everybody's crying. So that was always we thought that was a thing that was funny. Yeah. Oh, you did. That's we made a joke that this would happen, <laughs> and it did. But then we had another family, and he had two. Two. We never had that where there were two mothers that that, that never happened to any of them. Yeah. But, you know, it was there was all kinds of, listen, I can't tell you how many different sessions, you know, we went to and different people and all that stuff, so. But there was fun in it. It's funny and there's also, you know, it's sad too. Was there a real Adam? An Adam. Is there a real Adam? I feel like when we wrote the pilot, Adam was kind of based on my character, which was like a college guy who like on the surface was doing everything the right way. And then, you know, he cracks and obviously I'm still here. So it, we depart, that we was made a him more of like a druggie. He wasn't a, cause you weren't a druggie. So we had to make him more. Right. But he was doing like, he was like me in the sense that he was doing everything he was supposed to be doing. And like, I had been told to get sober all the time, but I'm like, I'm getting all my assignments in. I'm at this good school, you know. And we want—that's that was what we wanted. To, that's what Adam dying I thought was important was to show people that like just because you're not a quote unquote junkie and just because you're doing everything that you're supposed to be doing it doesn't mean you don't have a problem. It doesn't mean you don't need help. And like addiction has a lot of different. You know, it's not just a guy under a bridge. You know, there are functioning alcoholics. There are functioning drug addicts. One of the, one of the my favorite. Uh, speech and scene in the in the movie is when Adam tells his story of how his parents were with him and that we it was taken right out of uh, Matt's experience of the parents who are pushing so hard for him to be a certain <laughs> way and how that affected him now as far as Adam dying a um, couple of things one is my best friend died when I was in in the 60s it was a my best friend who I shared a house with and he was a heroin addict and he had stopped and then he went back and when he went back he overdosed and died so I, I have experienced that and I've known other people that have died and Nick has certainly known a lot of people uh, in the different programs that he's been in that are no longer here so I mean we, we didn't have a close friend that died I had a close friend that died but we took from that and, you know, it's certainly something that happens and it's really scary. 
One more question and then we'll, yeah. Um, during the film when uh, the protagonist is kind of stealing the car and you have his father uh, grab like, a fireplace poker, Yeah. kind of reminds me of Carrie's you know, previous role in Princess. Grace. That's right, That we so, did that intentionally. So I was kind of wondering um, what motivated the casting choice there to have him as your proxy or like the bad cop parent when the kind of image most people think of is that kind of unflinchingly noble character when they think of Carrie. Well, that's a good question. He talked about why was Carrie picked and why did we make him a pirate, and you know, which is very much like the Princess Bride. We did it because, uh, first of all, I'd never wor I hadn't worked with Carrie since Princess Bride. We've been in touch and been friends for a while, and I thought he'd be a perfect guy to uh, play that part. And then it's the underbelly of it. I mean, there's a romanticized part of a guy who's a movie star and plays the swashbuckling. And the reality is that he's just a human being, you know? And, uh, you know, and, and I love, there's one line in it that I love uh, where uh, Charlie's doing the, uh, the, 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 uh, the stand up and he says, uh, my, my father's a piece of shit. And he says, I have no joke there. I just wanted to say that. <laughs> and I think it's a great line because it's what he feels. It doesn't, it doesn't matter that he's thought of a certain way to the public. You know, the only thing that matters is how the child feels about his father, and that's what he's feeling at that point. So uh, I thought that was, and then the fact that it was Carrie, I like the idea that he was in a series of pirate movies like the Pirates of the Caribbean or whatever, and people came up to him and dueled with him and stuff like that because I never was a pirate, but people are always coming up to me and meatheading me all the time. So, <laughs> all right, well, thank you so much for.